So I'm delighted to introduce our speaker here today. Dr. Bert... Uh, Dr. Bart Ehrman is the James A. Gray Distinguished Professor of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He received his Ph.D. from Princeton Theological Seminary. He has written or edited over 31 books and have translated those into 28 separate languages. Five of his books, Misquoting Jesus, God's Problem, Jesus Interrupted, Forged, and How Jesus Became God, were on the New York Times bestseller list. His work has been featured in Time, Newsweek, The News Yorker, Washington Post, and he has appeared on uh, NBC's Dateline, CNN, The History Channel, National Geographic, The Discovery Channel, BBC, NPR, The Daily Show, and The Colbert Report. Here's a, sm a small fun fact about him. He has a dog named after William Shakespeare called Billy. You can ask him about that. And another interesting fact about him, which is that he has a blog on his website where he can respond to questions posted by uh, readers, and if you want expanded answers to those blog postings, you can uh, send a bit of money in. He uses all the money to support a variety of local charities. So during the reception, please ask him about the charities that he supports. He's very, very committed to charitable work and ending hunger and homelessness. So if you haven't guessed by now, he is one of the world's leading scholars on New Testament scholarship and the history of early Christianity. We have an honest-to-goodness celebrity here with us at YSU today. Uh, please join me in welcoming our renowned speaker, Dr. Bart Ehrman. Today. 
Uh, the title of the talk is the title of a book that I wrote, uh, Misquoting Jesus. Uh, that was the, the title of my book. Uh, the subtitle there, Scribes Who Change the Scriptures and Readers Who May Never Know. You will see why it's called that in a few minutes. So, how did we get the books of the New Testament? I'm going to be focusing on the New Testament here. Uh, one could give a very similar talk about the Old Testament. Uh, the problem I'm going to talk about here are even more pronounced when dealing with the Old Testament, but I'm, I'm mainly a New Testament scholar, so that's what I'm going to stick with here. So, let's start at the beginning with the originals of the books of the New Testament, and to explain about the originals, I'm simply going to take one of the books. Uh, what I say about the Gospel of Mark would apply to any of the books uh, of the New Testament. But I'm just picking one, and I'm picking the one that is probably our earliest gospel. As you probably know, there are four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, even though Matthew is the first to show up in the New Testament, it was not the first to be written. Probably the first to be written was the Gospel of Mark. Now, we're not really sure who wrote the Gospel of Mark. We call it Mark because that's what it's always been called for hundreds of years, centuries, many centuries. We've always called it the Gospel of Mark. The reality is the author never tells us who he is. Uh, the author of Mark never says, I, Mark, am writing to you, so-and-so. So, -and -so. so he, whoever wrote this thing wrote it anonymously, without telling us his name. He was writing in Greek. Uh, the Gospel of Mark originally composed in Greek. That's interesting, in part because uh, the Gospel of Mark is about Jesus, and Jesus did not speak Greek. Uh, Jesus spoke Aramaic. Aramaic was the language of Israel back in Jesus' day. It's what everybody spoke. Uh, they didn't speak Greek. Unless, the only people who spoke Greek in Israel were the upper-crust, highly-placed, elite aristocrats. They didn't speak some Greek. But basically, everybody spoke Aramaic. That means when you're reading your New Testament, you are uh, reading an English translation of Mark, and Mark was written in Greek, the words of Jesus in Mark, written in Greek, are translations of Aramaic. So you're reading English translations of Greek sayings that were originally spoken in Aramaic. Already you've got a problem. But that's not the problem I'm talking about. So, uh, you get the New Testament, Mark, written in Greek. We don't know by whom. We don't know exactly when. Uh, it's usually thought that Mark was written around the year 70 of the Common Era, A.D. 70 or 70 C.E. Well, that's also interesting. Jesus probably died around the year 30. So if Jesus died around the year 30, and Mark is the first account of his life that we have, and it is, it's the first account, it's written 40 years after the facts. Well, okay, uh, that's another interesting set of questions. So this book that I published on March 1st is dealing with that set of issues. What is going on in early Christianity is people are telling stories about Jesus over all these years before anybody gets them and writes them down. What's happening to the stories as they're told by word of mouth year after year after year, being translated into different languages for 40 years before we have any records? That's an interesting question, but it's also not what I'm dealing with here. Mark, when Mark wrote down his gospel, say around the year 70, we aren't sure where he lived. Let's say he lived in the city of Rome. Some people think he lived in Rome. He might have lived in Rome. Mark writes down his account of Jesus' life, his, the words and deeds of Jesus. Around the year 70, say, say it's in the city of Rome. Mark writes it. Okay, great. So there you've got the gospel of Mark. What happens next? How does somebody distribute a book in the ancient world? How do you reproduce a book? Well, the answer is... You reproduce it by hand. The only way to get a second copy of Mark is for somebody to make a copy. Well, how do they make a copy? Well, they've got a handwritten copy. So a handwritten copy is called a manuscript. Manuscript literally means handwritten. And so you've got, you've got Mark's original copy, and you want a copy. How do you get it? You copy it by hand. What if you can't read or write? Well, then you can't copy it by hand. How many people could read or write? Very few. As it turns out in the ancient world, most people were illiterate. Uh, there have been extensive studies of this phenomenon of literacy, both in the modern world, obviously, but also in the ancient world. The best estimates suggest 
that in the ancient world, at the best of times, maybe 10 to 15% of the population could read or write. 10%, 15%. At the best of times. And by best of times, I mean like Athens in the days of Socrates. 15%. In the days of Jesus, the first century, maybe 10% of the population could read or write. And there are good reasons for thinking that Christians had a lower literacy rate than other people. Because the, the earliest Christians came from the lower classes. All right? So fewer than 10%. So who copies Mark? Whoever in the congregation in Rome wants a copy who can read or write. That's the person who copies it. Is it a professional scribe? Probably not. Professional scribes were rare. They were highly educated. Probably just some guy who can read or write. Okay. So somebody takes Mark's copy and he copies it. What happens when you copy a long book by hand? Well, if you don't know what happens, try it sometime. <laughs> Go home tonight and copy the Gospel of Mark. I can tell you what's going to happen. You're going to make mistakes. Even if you try not to, you're going to make some mistakes. And if you're not very highly literate, not very highly educated, you're going to make more mistakes. Okay, that's fine. So somebody makes a copy of Mark and makes some mistakes. Then somebody comes along and copies that copy. When they copy that copy, they replicate the mistakes. They're copying the copy that they have that has mistakes in it. And they make their own mistakes. And then a third copyist comes along and copies the second copy that has, copy, has mistakes both of its own and of its predecessor. And the third copyist replicates the mistakes of both of its predecessors. And then a fourth person comes along and replicates the mistakes of the three previous people. And this goes on for year after year after year after year after year. With people copying and making mistakes and then copying mistakes. The only time a mistake gets corrected in a manuscript tradition, the only time a mistake gets corrected is when somebody realizes that his predecessor made a mistake and he tries to correct the mistake. The problem is there's no way of knowing whether he will correct the mistake correctly. He might correct the mistake incorrectly. In which case, you've got three forms of the text. The original text... You've got the mistaken copy, and you've got the mistaken correction of the, mis of the, of the mistake. Of, of the, yeah, the mistake. So, and so it goes on like that. It goes on like, for a very long time. So, uh, that's our situation. You get copies of the original, and you get copies of the copies of the copies. And what's being circulated, the reason you get these copies is this. This, this original copy, let's say it was in Rome. Well, Rome probably had a lot of churches uh, in the first century. So churches in the first century were not church buildings. There weren't any church buildings that we know of until 200 years later. People met in private homes. Churches met in private homes. Well, no home could accommodate more than 40 or 50 people, and so you've got different homes that have different churches. And so if your house church has a copy of this, this book, you're not even calling it anything, you're calling it the gospel. If somebody's got a copy of the gospel, and another house church wants it, they have to make the copy. Somebody comes and visits from Ephesus, the city of Ephesus. They say, you've got a gospel? We want a gospel. Okay, make a copy. So they take the copy back to Ephesus. And then somebody from Ephesus makes a copy, and that copy ends up someplace else. And that copy ends up someplace else. That copy ends up someplace else. So the copy spread throughout the Roman world, and that's what happens. That happens for many years until we get our earliest surviving copy today. Copies of the manuscript copies of the Gospel of Mark have been discovered. Our oldest copy of the Gospel of Mark that we have, the oldest thing, the oldest manuscript of any kind that we have of the Gospel of Mark is called P45 and it dates from the year 220 CE. All right, roundabout, plus or minus 25 years. So it's called P45 because it's written on papyrus, the ancient writing material, papyrus. Uh, back before they used paper, they used these reed plants that grow in Egypt that you can make a writing material out of. It was a very good writing material. Uh, and so ancient manuscripts are copied on papyrus uh, manuscripts. And it's called P45 because it was the 45th papyrus manuscript of the Bible that was discovered in catalog. So it's P45. This is what it looks like. This is one page of it. Uh, so you'll notice it's not a complete page. Uh, the, uh, this is one of the best pages from the manuscript. This is one of the best pages from the manuscript. The manuscript contains about half the chapters of Mark, but in incomplete form. 
It's got portions of about half the chapters of Mark. You notice there are holes here uh, where the papyrus is worn out. Uh, the margin was here. Uh, doesn't look like we have a margin on this side of the page. The page would have, uh, looks like we have a top margin here. So this would have been the first line. And we don't have a bottom margin. So this would have been a larger page. Uh, and this is one of the pages from P45. Uh, you'll notice that it's written, you won't know, I mean, I'll tell you, it's written in Greek. Um, you might notice that there doesn't seem to be any paragraphs. There's very little punctuation. There's no division between sentences, or very rare division between sentences. There's no division between words. That's how they wrote in the ancient world. They didn't, they didn't put spaces between words. That made it interesting to read. Try that sometime. Uh, and you know, if you're copying something that's a little bit hard to read, it's going to be a little bit hard to copy. And so you get more mistakes as a result. So, uh, well, this is one page from P45, the oldest copy we have of Mark. The oldest copy we have of Mark is a hundred and what? A hundred fifty years after Mark was originally produced. A hundred fifty years after Mark was produced is when we have our first copy. How many mistakes are in this copy? We have no way of knowing. The only way you would know how many mistakes there are is if you had the original to compare this copy to, and then you can see how many mistakes there are. But we don't have the original. What we have is this. You can see that there's a problem here about knowing what was in the original New Testament. Our next copy after P45 is from the 4th century, dating from around the year 350 or 360. Uh, it is a manuscript that is complete. We have our first complete copy of Mark from about the year 360. In other words, our first complete copy of Mark we have is 300 years after the original. Many people in our world today are very, very interested in knowing what the words of the Bible are. They're committed to the words of the Bible. They're interested in knowing what the words mean. If you don't know what the words were, then you really can't know what they meant. In order to interpret what they mean, you have to know what they are. And yet we don't have the originals, we have these later copies. Well, let me tell you, give you some information about surviving copies of the New Testament. The surviving manuscripts. There's good news and there's bad news. The good news is, we have more copies of the New Testament than we have for any other book from the ancient world. By a landslide. We have more copies of the New Testament than for any other book from the ancient world. We have something like 5,500 manuscripts of the New Testament. That's way more than we have for Homer, or for Cicero, or for Quintilian, or for Euripides, or name your ancient author. We've got way more for the Bible, for the New Testament, than for any other. So that's, that's good news. Uh, some 5,500. The bad news, of course, is that we don't have any originals. And we don't have any copies of originals. We don't have any copies of copies of originals, or copies of copies of copies of originals. We've got later copies, but we've got lots of them. So that's good. It's not, not surprising, by the way, that we have so many copies. Ask yourself, who was copying books in the Middle Ages? Most of our manuscripts for ancient works come from the Middle Ages. Who was copying books in the Middle Ages? The people copying books in the Middle Ages were monks in Europe. Christian monks. Which books are they going to be copying? Are they more likely to copy the Gospel of John or a play of Euripides? <laughs> These are Christian monks. They're copying the Bible. So of course you get more copies of the Bible than anything else, which is great. It's great for us if we want to know about the, the New Testament. But so Okay, so it's good. We've got 5,500 copies. They're ages. The oldest copy of any part of the New Testament we have, the oldest copy we have whatsoever, is one called P52, the 52nd papyrus discovered and uh, discovered, uh, catalog, and here it is. This is the size of a credit card, and this is the whole thing. Now it is written on front and back, so that's good, so there's more on the back. 
Uh, that shows you that it was not written on a scroll. It was written in book form, like we have. It's called, it's called a codex, where you, you write on both sides of the page, and then you sew it together in the binding. So uh, that's good. Now, this is, this is interesting. You have an entire top margin here, and then you've got some letters. When this thing was discovered in a trash heap in Egypt, the, the archaeologists who discovered it didn't know what it was from. They knew it was from some text. They had no idea what it was from. You know, is this from Homer? Is this from Euripides? Is this, what, what is this from? I don't know. It's just a little scrap. So they put it in an envelope, sent it off with a bunch of other fragments to a museum uh, or to a library. This ended up in the basement of the John Rylands Library in Manchester, England. In 1935, there was a scholar who was an expert in ancient Greek manuscripts who was looking through uh, an envelope that had this thing in it. He pulled it out, he started looking at it, and he saw this word here. Semio. 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 That, that means signifying. Signifying. That's an unusual word. Huh. That word occurs in John chapters 18 and 19, uh, where Jesus, uh, in John chapter 19, is talking about... Uh, to Pontius Pilate, how he that how he's going to die, signifying. Jesus said, signi signifying how he was going to die. He thought this might be from the Gospel of John, and he looks it up, and this is from the Gospel of John. This is from the Gospel of John. This is Jesus' trial before Pilate in the Gospel of John. So, if you know where this is from, then you can tell by putting the words together probably what the lines said, because you know what most Greek manuscripts have for these words. You've got a top margin here, and you've got writing on the back, which means that you know basically how much text there was on this page. You can figure out how many, uh, how many letters it would take to get from these letters down to these letters on the next line, then down to these letters. And since you know what's on the back, you know how many lines it would take to get to the bottom of this page before you flip it over and start writing on the back side. On the basis of this credit card size fragment, you can determine how many pages were in this manuscript of the Gospel of John. So there are scholars who are experts in papyrus. They're called papyrologists. Uh, they do this sort of thing on Friday night, and we've got nothing else to do. Uh, we calculate how many pages are in the Gospel of John in a manuscript like this. Uh, this is P52. This is our oldest manuscript. It's great. It is absolutely great. We have this thing. It is usually dated to 125 plus or minus 25 years. Around the year 125. The way you date manuscripts, by the way, is on the basis of handwriting analysis. There's a, an entire discipline you can get a PhD in that learns how to date manuscripts based on a handwriting analysis. Uh, and so, you, but you date it within about 20, uh, within a 50-year gap is what you need in order to have reliable data. So, uh, okay, it's great having a manuscript written from 125, but it is only the size of a credit card. So, if you want to know what's in the rest of the Gospel of John in that manuscript, you have no way of knowing. Most of our manuscripts are not that early. The majority of our manuscripts date after the 9th century. So the majority of our manuscripts, 94% of our manuscripts, are at least 800 years after the originals. 800 years of copying. All right, how many mistakes are in these manuscripts? So we got 5,500 manuscripts. You can compare them with one another and see, well, how many differences are there? Wherever there's a difference, somebody's made a mistake. Okay, so how many mistakes are there? Throughout the Middle Ages, Scholars did not realize how big a problem copying by hand was. They just didn't realize how big a problem was because they just had no reason to realize it. They knew that people made mistakes, but I don't think they realized how many mistakes people make. That changed in a big way in the year 1707. In the year 1707, there was a scholar at Oxford named John Mill. John Mill. He's unrelated to the Victorian John Stuart Mill that you may have heard of. This is a different John Mill. John Mill, 1707, published an edition of the Greek New Testament, a printed edition. This is after the invention of printing. He, he published a printed edition of the Greek New Testament. He had spent 30 years of his life working on this edition. During those 30 years, he had examined 100 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. He had examined 100 Greek manuscripts, and what he did in his edition is, 
He, at the top of the page, he would print what he thought was the, the, the Greek New Testament, and then at the bottom of the page, he would list places where the manuscripts had differences among them. Okay, the top would give a running Greek text of the New Testament, the bottom would indicate places where these hundred manuscripts had differences among them. To the shock and dismay of his readers, John Mill's Greek New Testament indicated 30,000 places of difference among the manuscripts. 30,000 places where the manuscripts differed from one another. Yikes! That's a lot of differences. The enemies of John Mill said that he was trying to make the text of the New Testament uncertain. People on his side pointed out he didn't invent these 30,000 places. He just knows that they exist. Well, huh. 30,000 mistakes seems like a lot. But John Mill did this on the basis of 100 manuscripts. And he didn't cite all of the differences he found. He only cited the differences he thought were important. Today, we don't have 100 manuscripts. We have 5,500 manuscripts. How many differences do we know about in our surviving manuscripts? Well, the short story is, we don't know. Nobody has been able to count all the differences, even with the developments of computer technology. Some scholars think that there are 200,000 differences in our manuscripts. Some say, think there are 300,000. Some think there are 400,000. Probably more think there's 400,000, but we don't really know. What I tell my students is that it's easiest to put it in comparative terms. There are more differences in our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. There are more differences in our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. That's a lot of differences. So that's the bad news. The good news is that most of those differences, the vast majority of those differences, are unimportant, insignificant, immaterial, and matter for nothing more than to show that scribes in the ancient world could spell no better than students can today. <laughs> Every time you misspell a word, it's a difference, it's a change, it's a mistake. And scribes couldn't spell very well. They could be excused, by the way. They didn't have spell check. <laughs> you students out there, how you can possibly turn in a paper with misspelled words? The computer tells you it's misspelled. It puts it in red. I mean, how observant do you have to be? <laughs> it tells you. OK, sorry. So, uh, so uh, scribes didn't have spell check. Scribes didn't have dictionaries. And most scribes, many scribes didn't even care how they spelled something. That's pretty obvious because sometimes you'll have the same word occur three times in a couple lines and the scribe will spell it differently. And so like, he just doesn't care. So, so most of the differences don't matter much. Let me say something about the kinds of changes, kinds of mistakes we find in the manuscripts. Uh, first, there are accidental mistakes where the scribe just, they just accidentally, there's a slip of the pen and they make a mistake. So uh, misspellings, by far the most common. There are other kinds that are fairly common, though. Here's one. This is a passage from Luke chapter 12, verses 8 and 9, where Jesus says that uh, whoever acknowledges me before people, uh, uh, the Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels of God. Uh, whoever denies me, uh, will be, uh, me will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son, da, 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 and he goes on from there. Notice this line and this line end with the same words. What happens if a scribe is copying? And he's obviously, you know, what you do is you've got the copy you're copying and you're reading it. So before the angels, before the angels of God, of God, will, will, will. You, you're, you're, you're reading a couple words and you're writing a couple words. What happens if you read these two wor these words here, before the angels of God, you write them down, and then your eye goes back to the page but you think you just copied those words before the angels of God. And then you continue with this line because you think you already copied that line. If you didn't copy that line, you copied that line. You leave out this line as a result. 
See what I mean? See how that works? And so as a result, you get this. We'll acknowledge before the angels of God and everyone who speaks a word against the Son that you leave out this line. That happens with some fair regularity in our manuscripts, as we turned out. And there's a word, there, there's a term that, uh, that we have for this. Uh, if you, uh, if you uh, have an eye skip, when your eye skip from one line to another, that's called parablepsis. Parablepsis, your eye skip. And if it skips because you have the words ending the same way, the lines ending the same words, that's called homo italiaton. So this kind of mistake is called parablepsis occasioned by homo italiaton. <laughs> so uh, for the, you students with extra credit, uh, I guarantee you, you'll get double extra credit if you remember that. Parablepsis occasioned by homo italiaton. Well, there are other kinds of accidental mistakes, including some rather serious blunders. Sometimes the scribes left out a word. Sometimes they left out a page. We have cases where scribes leave out a page. Or other things. Pretty serious blunders sometimes happen. Now, the thing about these kinds of accidental mistakes, misspellings, paraplexes, occasionally by helping tell you, Tom, leaving out a sentence or something, the thing about those kinds of serious mistakes is that they're pretty easy to, to note. If you're copying, if you're looking, if you're studying manuscripts, you can find these mistakes and you realize, oh, look at that, he left out a word. And it's pretty easy to detect. Less easy to detect are intentional changes in the text. There are a number of places where the text appears to have been changed on purpose by scribes. Now you can never know, you can never know for certain that a scribe intentionally changed something, but if a change makes a lot of sense, then probably somebody's thinking about it, as opposed to like nonsense, or somebody's probably not thinking. So let me give you some examples of intentional changes. Probably the most famous story about Jesus in the New Testament is the story of the woman taken in adultery. The reason I think this is the most famous story about Jesus is because it's in every Hollywood movie. Uh, you cannot make a Hollywood movie about Jesus without this story. In fact, you've got to include, no matter what. So when Mel Gibson published, produced his movie, The Passion of the Christ, uh, a few years ago, I don't know if you all saw that, but it's, it's about the last hours of Jesus. But since it's a Jesus movie, he had to include this story. So he included it as a flashback. Jesus remembered it because you've got to have the story. That's the rule of Hollywood. You've got to have the story. This is a very, so the, the story, in case you don't know which story I'm talking about, it's this. Jesus is preaching to the, he's, he's teaching the crowd by the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. And the Jewish leaders drag this woman in front of him. And they say to him, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. According to the law of Moses, we're supposed to stone her to death. What do you say we should do? Okay, so they're setting this trap for Jesus. Because, uh, so, either way he answers this, he's burned. Because if Jesus says, uh, well, no, forgive her. He's breaking the law of Moses. But if he says, yeah, I stoned her to death, then he's breaking his own teachings of love and forgiveness. Either way, it's not good. So what's he supposed to do? Well, as you know, Jesus has a way of getting out of these traps uh, in the New Testament. So he stoops down, on this occasion he stoops down and starts writing on the ground. We don't know why he was writing. He was writing something. There are all sorts of theories about what he was writing. He writes something on the ground. And then he looks up and he's, he says, let the one without sin among you be the first to cast a stone at her. Stoops back down, starts writing again. One by one, the Jewish leaders start feeling guilty for their own sins, and they leave, until finally Jesus looks up, it's just a woman. And he stands up and he says, is there no one left to condemn you? And she says, no, Lord, no one. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. <coughs> Boom, that's it. Fantastic story. Fantastic story. With just one problem. It wasn't originally in the Gospel of John. In fact, it wasn't originally in any of our Gospels. This story was added by scribes. That is not a debated issue among scholars. This has been recognized by scholars for several hundred years. 
Uh, the oldest manuscripts don't have it. The earliest church fathers don't know about it. This, the, the writing style, the vocabulary of this story is totally unlike the rest of the Gospel of John. It's intrusive in its context. This story was added. So in your Bibles today, you'll find a footnote saying, well, actually, the ancient authorities don't have this because it's not, it wasn't original. This is, this is a, clearly an intentional change. Whoever added the, gospel, added the story to the Gospel of John didn't do it through a slip of the pen. This is somebody meant to do this, to add the story. It's a fantastic story. I'm glad they added the story. It's a great story, but it wasn't originally in the Gospel of John. If you want to know what John wrote, this wasn't part of it. Well, that's a big change. Yeah, well, here's another big change. The last 12 verses of Mark. Mark is my favorite gospel. I think one of the reasons it's my favorite gospel is because Mark doesn't beat you over the head with his theology. Mark doesn't beat you over the head with his theology. Mark is subtle and brilliant, I think. And it's terse, it's tight, it's brilliant. I love the way the Gospel of Mark ends. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is turned over to the authorities, the Jewish authorities, who hand him over to Pontius Pilate, who condemns him to crucifixion. Jesus is crucified, he's dead, he's buried. On the third day, the women go to the tomb, and Jesus' body's not there. There's a young man there, and the man says, you're living for Jesus of Nazareth? He's not here, he's been raised. Go tell Peter and the disciples that he will meet them in Galilee. And then Mark says, the women fled from the tomb, and they didn't say anything to anyone, for they were afraid. Period. It ends there. You read that ending, and you say, ay 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 how can it end there? They didn't tell anyone? Didn't Peter and the disciples find out? Didn't Jesus show up and appear to Peter and the disciples? Did, uh, how could it end there? Well, that's where it ended. When, when, oh, by the way, the reason, I think it's brilliant that it ends there. For several reasons. One reason is, in the Gospel of Mark, this is only in the Gospel of Mark. It's, it's not that way in Matthew, Luke, or John. In the Gospel of Mark, nobody can figure out who Jesus is. No one in the Gospel of Mark has a clue who he is. His family thinks that he's gone crazy. The townspeople that Nazareth, where he grew up, think that he's just a carpenter boy. They can't figure out why he's so smart. The Jewish leaders think that he's possessed by the devil, which is why he cast out demons. The, he gets rejected by everybody, denied by everybody. Even his disciples don't understand. It's a, it's a continual motif in Mark's Gospel. The disciples never get it. And at the end... They still don't get it because they never hear that he's been raised from the dead. They still don't get it at the end. Brilliant. Fantastic. The other thing that's great is that in the, in the Gospel of Mark, uh, you, you'll notice this, is, this again is only in Mark. Jesus will heal somebody and he'll say, don't tell anyone. And the guy will go out and tell everybody. <laughs> so the whole thing is Jesus keeps saying, don't tell, and they tell. And at the end, the women are told to tell, and they don't tell. <laughs> See, it just flips it. <laughs> but, so, so it's this brilliant, brilliant ending for the Gospel of Mark. So, and the reader reads this and comes up short, including the, the scribes. The scribes are copying this thing. They write down, uh, and the women fled from the tomb. They didn't say anything to anyone, for they were afraid. And they realized, stop there. And then the scribes said, ay, 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 I'm going to stop there. And so they added an ending. In your Gospels in English, you'll have another 12 verses with a footnote saying these weren't originally there. These 12 verses absolutely were not originally there. Nobody thinks these 12 verses were originally there who's a scholar in this field. In these 12 verses, the women go, do go tell the disciples. The disciples do go to Galilee and see Jesus. Jesus gives them his final commands. He tells them that they're to make disciples of all the nations, and the people that they convert, they're supposed to baptize, those who are converted and baptized will be able to speak in foreign tongues. They'll be able to handle deadly snakes. And if they drink poison, it won't hurt them. 
This is the passage that the Appalachian snake handlers in my part of the world get their theology from, that they can handle deadly snakes during the worship services. I've always thought that somebody in the ambulance on the way to the hospital should tell one of these guys, you know, actually those verses weren't originally in the Bible. Because <laughs> <laughs> they weren't. Okay. Uh, I'll just do one more. Uh, I've got two more examples. I'm just going to give one more. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is being crucified, and he prays, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. In the early church, it's only Luke, by the way, that Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. It's only Luke. In the early church, it was understood that Jesus was praying for the Jewish people who had handed him over to the Romans. He's praying for forgiveness for the Jews. And that seemed confusing to a lot of early Christian interpreters. Because God obviously had not forgiven the Jews. Early Christians thought that God was against the Jews. In fact, there came to be an idea that the reason Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in the year 70 was because God was punishing the Jews for killing Jesus. Well, how could Jesus pray for forgiveness for the Jews if God didn't forgive them? How did scribes deal with that problem? They dealt with that problem by taking out the prayer. They eliminated the prayer from their copies of Luke. And so a lot of our copies of Luke don't have Jesus saying this. And it appears that scribes took it out because they knew full well that God, in their opinion, that God had not forgiven the Jews. So, okay, another kind of, another kind of intentional thing. So let me skip my last one and get to my... Very few concluding remarks before opening it up for questions. Is the text of the New Testament reliable? The short answer is we cannot be 100% certain that we are right in 100% of the times that we try to figure out what the authors wrote. Scholars are dedicated to figuring out what the authors originally wrote. We want to know what Mark originally wrote, what John originally wrote. We, we usually think we're pretty close, but the reality is we can't be certain. This may not be a problem for you. It's not a problem for me. It should be a problem for somebody who thinks that we need to know every word as it was originally written in the Bible. Because the reality is we can't know every word that was originally written in the Bible. There are passages where scholars continue to debate. Did it originally say this or did it originally say that? Were these words originally in there, or were they originally not in there? Did somebody add these words? Somebody take away these words? So there are, there are pa many, pass many passages that scholars continue to debate, and there are some passages where we simply will never know. Thank you very much.